There's one passage that I found this week that just really um, says a lot in just a few verses that I thought I would read right up front. And um, it just says, uh, going to 2 Peter chapter 3, it talks about the day of the Lord. And uh, in verse 3, um, or actually, I'm just going to begin at verse 1 of chapter 3 and just read uh, the first 13 verses. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Notice that the scoffers even said the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Talking about the flood. By the, to- by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, future judgment, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With a Lord, the Lord, the, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. What a powerful passage of scripture that Peter writes under the inspiration of the spirit. He speaks about the creation of the earth. He speaks about the flood, the recreation after the flood, the judgment of God and the recreation of a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells every day every 24 hour day you have on this earth reminds you should remind you of the creative power of God can God be trusted with what he says is God truthful I mean would he lie to us um, I mean would would he say one thing and mean another uh, in especially in these Genesis passages now when I, I was a high schooler they told me in biology class, that the world was created through evolution over millions of years. In the last number of years, a lot of atheistic scientists are saying that it's now billions of years, um, and in order to give them a better chance, I think, about a number of things. Pretty soon, it's going to be trillions of years, because I believe that the evolutionary, evolutionary process has been increasing along with the United States debt over the years. From millions to billions, now to trillions. Okay? Now, I can't prove that for certain or not. But it just so happens that we believe that if we have more and more time, that somehow everything is going to get worked out, including debt. And it doesn't help us. But there are three basic ways um, to look at the creation. The first one is this, that matter is eternal. All the substance in the whole universe are eternal, always existed, but maybe existed in different forms. Uh, It started with a small, dense ball of matter, and and then an, an explosion, 
and that through time and chance has turned into the world that we know it. Then there are those who say that matter is not eternal, but it generated uh, spontaneously. There was no cause. The starting point is the Big Bang. Matter was scattered over the universe, kept expanding through time and chance, and the world and all that is in it came together. The third area that we can look at is that matter came into existence as the result of one who stands beyond matter, who created it and called it into existence. And so in Genesis chapter 1, we see that space, mass, and time were created. And biblical creation demonstrates to us that every molecule in the universe God formed, all the matter, all the living things, all the cells were designed with a specific DNA to be the living things on the earth. And so when our children and our students are being taught about the origins of the universe, they are being taught about the existence or non-existence of God. If they're being taught possibility one or two, they're being taught that uh, uh, atheism is the only logical conclusion for, the, for, God, for this world to be. And it's only being taught when we're taught possibility number three that theism is even possible. And again, there are other ways to look at possibility number three because there is, is pantheism, which is the belief, and mainly New Agers pick this up, that God is everything and you and I are God. But I've had enough conversations with all of you to know that you're not God. <laughs> all right? But there's that kind of spark of, yes, we're, we're, we're all God. Uh, but that's not what b the Bible clearly tells us. Right? And so then there's deism that somehow God started it out but left it all to run on its own. It's kind of the old, what I learned was the, the watchmaker or the clockmaker sets it in place and then life discontinues. And the pantheistic perspective is, is that God is basically the world and everything in it is God. Your dog is a God. Some of you might treat your dog like that, but he's no God. Right, especially the cat people, they get a little <laughs> weird, weird about things at times, <laughs> right? But the other possibility is deism, and you know, as I said, that that somehow God kind of set it all in place. There was the Big Bang, and then everything kind of happened after that. The other possibility, a biblical theism, and that's what we see very clearly in Genesis chapter 1. Because there had to be a cause. There had to be someone outside of time in order for us to be here. Because life has purpose. The world has order to it. And there are important words that the writer of Genesis uh, Moses himself gives to us in the Hebrew. In the beginning, uh, the creator God, Elohim, begins uh, the, the creation of the world. And the beginning word connotes not time or space. It basically shows us that this beginning was beyond time or space because someone else created it. And it's important that we talk about God this way, not in terms of of time because God created time. He created space. He created matter. So God exists outside of time. And that's the theological word that, first of all, God is eternal. Okay, so just say that this morning. God is eternal. Okay. God has always existed. God is not bound by time or space. So when we talk about God, we're not talking about a man who is very, very old and has a long beard and is living out in space somewhere. Uh, but what we see very clearly that, that, that 
our time is linear and there was a starting point. All right, so this morning to illustrate this a little bit to help us, it's a good illustration that, that I remember learning from my pastor. And, and, and that, you know, time had a beginning, so creation. So can somebody come up here and stand on this side over here and, and represent creation? Okay, David, thank you so much for volunteering. <laughs> so there's a starting point right here. Okay, now we need an Adam and an Eve. Okay, no, I, I was going to bring in some animals this morning too and some things, but we realized that God created light, the stars, all of those play, things. But then he created human beings, Adam and Eve. So can I have an Adam and Eve? Okay, oh, Sharon. <laughs> okay, all right, good. So we're going to have the whole worship team. Yeah, pretty close, yeah. <laughs> they don't know that, yeah. But after Adam and Eve, like there are their, their children, and we got Abraham. So do we have somebody with a nice looking beard that we can have for Abraham? Right? Tyler, Tyler okay, so we got Tyler up here. So Abraham, and, and, and who was his wife, uh, Tyler? Who was Abraham's wife? Sarah. Sarah, so we need Sarah. <laughs> and she just happens to be pregnant, so that's good, right? So we go through all the prophets, right? And, 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 and the story of Israel, and then, then we get to the cross, right? We get to the, the, the Jesus life and before the cross and his resurrection. So I'm not good at that, but we, we'll just do this here. And then we go through all the way down to us uh, is time. So there's a starting point, and then in what we read from uh, Second Peter today, there's an end point to this time, but there is eternity, right? There's eternity. So God, where would you place God on this time frame? He can't be on that timeline because he's outside of it, right? Now, I don't want anybody to play God right now. So there's enough people in our culture trying to be God. But God is outside of that timeline. There is a beginning. There's everything in between, thousands of years, right? And then there's going to be an end and a recreation of the heavens and the earth that God is going to do. It's an incredible thing, right? Abraham and Sarah, you may sit down. Adam and Eve, you may sit down. Dave, who's the world, representative of the world, <laughs> sit down, right? So time is linear. There's a starting point. And, and, and we see through history, particularly the history of the world, the time of the world, the, the, the thousands of years through time. So God is eternal. That's one of my favorite attributes of God. We see this in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in the beginning with God, right? And we see the creative power of the Word, who is Jesus Christ. And Ch John chapter 1 is talking about Jesus. So Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. And we also know because of, in verse 2 of, of Genesis 1 that the Spirit is co-eternal with the Father. So when we talk about the God who creates, we're talking about the Father, we're talking about the Son, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the triune creative God who did all of these things for us. And, and the amazing thing we need to understand is that, that God is eternal, but secondly, that God is the creator of the universe. And uh, he did not borrow or turn it into something. He created matter and, and time and space. And God is not only eternal and the creator, but he's also the sustainer of all things. That's why deism does not work. Because for everything to hold together and hang together, there has to be one outside of it to sustain it all. And so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Here's what's interesting. God didn't just make 
the complete creation and unfolded in those days, God creates the primordial matter from which he creates the world. God didn't just throw it all out there and was uninvolved and just let the creation do its own thing. God first created matter, then he turned the matter into what we now experience in this life, in this planet. And that God was actively involved in creation and continues to be actively involved in creation. So the idea of deism, the idea of the watchmaker, goes completely out the window because now we see the providence and sovereignty of God. God was and is ultimately and intricately involved with every aspect of creation. Nothing is done by accident. There's not one rogue molecule in the entire universe, not one, because God is the sustainer of the universe. If you go to Acts chapter 17, and if you remember us going through the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul ends up going into Athens. And Athens, of course, at that time was a place of of great learning and knowledge and great debate over a whole number of things. And as Paul comes into this city, um, in, in uh, verse 16, it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. And as he continues on in verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, uh, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this is because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. That cuts through all of those philosophies that, that Paul was up against. And so uh, Paul speaks to them in verse 22. He stands up into the meeting of it, the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And that is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So in the culture of that time, they just had lots of different gods. Some of them had statues. Some of them were, they had different things up all over Athens. And then they have this statue of an unknown God. Because they just wanted to make sure that they were covering their bases. And they had all these gods, little g gods. And as a result of that, you could see the, the debates and a number of things that are going on. And then verse 24, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For one man he made all the nations that, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this, that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. And Paul goes on to speak to them about God being the judge of the world and that justice will happen. I I love this interaction that Paul has with the pagan atheistic, well, not atheistic culture, but it it was just an, uh, they they were into such idolatry, right? And, And he argues with them philosophy. And Paul stands in the midst of them And he shows them that God is not just eternal, but he's the creator of the universe and he's the sustainer of the universe and that the very breath that they have and everything they have is from him. Did you know that as well? 
You're here on planet Earth right now because of God's creative plan for your life. There's no one else like you that's ever lived on this earth. Did you know that? And, and, and God has a plan for you. But when we will look at kind of the atheistic structures of today, it's very easy to say, um, you know, conception um, through to, to death that people really don't matter. And we see this with all the crises that are going on within our world today. God is, is eternal. He's the creator of the universe and he's the sustainer of the universe. The very seasons that we have. All the, all the things that go on even with weather and, and how even as human beings we try to predict the weather. And, and, but, but the chances of it of trying to predict the next month of weather is very, very vague. Even a couple of days out, it's vague. Talk to the farmers in our church, right? But God's in control of all of these things. A.W. Pink wrote, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and that he argues he is infinite and omnip omnipotent for no finite being possesses the power to create and none but an omnipotent being could create the heavens and the earth. The simple, clear language of Genesis is, is very powerful for us. So today, we are hoping to get through Genesis day two and day three. Are you excited? Okay. And, and as, as we go through this, it, it's, what, what's great about it is that, as, and God said, look at verse six, Genesis one, there will be a vault between the waters to separate the water from the water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. I was wide awake around 530 this morning. I went outside and I could feel the vault above me because it was heavy. Right. There's a separation. And even back then, it was even a different kind of separation. And, and day two was a creative process more than an act of creating because God, God made some divisions, as we will see. But when, what they're looking for, scientists are looking for, and the other planets around us, Mars, for signs of life, or why do astronauts look for clay and other planets? The, the answer is the precious commodity that we call water. Without it, we can't live, right? Right? And, and this, the, this, this whole world um, is, is just filled with it, right? And underground and so many things. We have, we have a well. We, we kind of know a good spot for a well out there at the corner of the building at the front. In fact, there's an aquifer that just kind of flows right through. Maybe we can sell bottled water. I don't know. <laughs> that, that, there's lots of water there, right? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep of the waters, and the Hebrew language just speaks about this because this, this water is such an indication of life. And the expanse God created is sky or heaven for, for, for all that the, the, the moistures that's suspended in the air from the blue skies to the galaxies beyond all this water. Water covers, I believe, 71% of the, the earth's service, right? And, and it, it's, it's crucial for us to live. Without it, we're in trouble. And earth, the earth right now is the only place in the universe that supports a biosphere where life is known to exist. There's no other place like it. Aren't you glad? And aren't you glad that God made you a part of, the, of this planet and gave you life? Your very breath is in his hands. What is clear that there's an intentional relationship uh, between the first three days of creation and the last three days. And on this second day, God separates the atmospheric waters from the terrestrial waters by an arching expanse, the sky. And this set suggests that previously there had been a, even a more dense moisture in sur surrounding the earth. God's work involves making divisions and distinctions in order to fill those divisions with life. 
And so what we see very clearly, day one is light. But day four, the luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars are, are created. Day two, the sea and the sky, the expanse is created. And, and day five, God fills them with the birds and the fish. Day three, the earth and the vegetation. And day six, the land animals and human beings. God showed his power again by putting limits on the waters that covered the globe. Some were confined to the seas, the rest of the sky. The upper waters were kept there by the expanse or the firmament is another way to look at it. From earth, the sky, the firmament appears to be a, a sort of dome that prevents the waters in the clouds from falling to the earth only when God releases them. And then we see God's creation day three. Look at verses nine to 13. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into, notice this, one place, and let the, ground, the, the, the dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the, the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according the, to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. On the third day, God groups the waters and the land in their rightful place. He collected the waters, partitioned the skies, and conceived of land. The dry ground is called earth, which already debuted in verses 1 and 2, except it emerged dry. And the text did not say whether the land rose uh, to the top to trap the water or it developed craters to store the waters or by a great depression or ele elevation. We're not told how that happened. But then vegetation is part of the ordered universe of the true God. There is no cyclical seasonal myth to explain it. God started it once and for all. And moreover, moreover, while pagans believed in the deities of the deep as forces to be reckoned with, this account shows that God controls the boundaries of the seas. God was not done with day three, which included his command for vegetation and, or grass, grass seeds, varieties of seed, fruit-bearing plants, and, and trees to sprout uh, that, that, that s s uh, sprung up and, and, and produced on this new land uh, through th uh, the surface of the land. This Hebrew word for produce occurs only one other time in the Bible, and it's again for ve vegetation in Joel 2, verse 22. This vegetation or grass, plants or shoots, seeds, trees and fruit. The word bear means conceiving, producing and yielding already. So God produced uh, the, the creation of the land and the plants. And even more important for mankind was this pr provision on the third day. This dry land on which we could live and and have plants to sustain life with the distinct varieties of plants. Bear, they bear witness to God's uh, over-organizing power and these distinctions sh should not be blurred because we see the rules against mixed breeding and a whole number of things in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 22. God created plant life that was mature bearing producing and yielding fruit, plants with seeds, fruit that was already producing because God always created everything mature. God makes the dry ground appear and creates plant life. Everything created is according to their kind, apples and oranges. You know the distinction between the two, right? Throw me an orange. If somebody throws you an apple, you might get upset because you know there's a distinct kind. All the plants have a distinct kind and DNA. And everything on the earth was readied and prepared for the wild animals, the cattle, those domesticated animals, and for Adam and Eve. And God said 
It was good. It was good. Complete, ready to go. Complete and ready to go. Many modern readers stumble over the six days of creation. They ask, how could it have happened so quickly in a day, all of these things? It's interesting to note before the 19th century and the work of Charles Darwin, the the question was the opposite amongst people. For instance, in the 16th century, John Calvin encountered skepticism concerning the biblical account because it took so long for God to create in six days. Most people would say, well, how, why would God take that long to do that? Because they knew that God could create instantaneously, if you will. Evolutionists often claim that creationists deny science. But what science do creationists deny? And what does history say? Science requires an orderly universe in order to study it. But why should it be orderly in the first place? Evolution can't explain it. However, the Bible confirms the natural sciences. And and it teaches, first of all, that there is a divine lawmaker, the God of order, not confusion, 1 Corinthians 14.33, who made the universe. God, made, God gave mankind dominion, as we will see, implying that we are meant to study the creation and find out how it works. Universities were started in the Middle Ages by churches and Christians. It was a church invention. First laid, they first laid the foundations of the natural sciences. Its pioneers were often clergymen or pastors did you know that we have many who have been and they they called themselves kind of natural philosophers because natural philosophy was the old term for science a few centuries later the reformation led to the rediscovery of even a more objective understanding of scripture which was uh, transferred to nature science Historian Peter Harrison wrote, the Bible and its literal interpretation have played a vital role in the development of Western science. And I read an article recently where there was a few hundred scientists and people of the past who believed in the creation of the world by God, Louis Pasteur being one of them, 1822 to 1895. He was a firm believer in creation. He disproved spontaneous generation, that life came from non-life. And if you remember in your science class years ago, I don't know if they teach this anymore, he did an experiment with flies because they just thought fly maggots just appeared out of nowhere. And he did an experiment where he put meat in a jar that was covered over by kind of a translunit or or maybe some cloth or something like that. And flies would land on it and then lay the maggots to show that they just didn't, you know, form themselves or come out of nothing. Life always begets life. Now, some of you might be wondering about your next door neighbor or somebody like that. You might be wondering about someone in your family. You wondered where they come from. (laughs) But God has variety and diversity. And evolution relies on variation and natural selection, but creationists don't even deny these. Not today or not even before Darwin. We just deny the unproven claim that such processes could turn bacteria into a biologist. Did you hear what I said? Because a one-celled organism can't multiply itself into something different because it's a kind that God talks about. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did God create the universe? I mean, we've been understanding who has created from Genesis chapter 1. We even understand what he created in Genesis chapter 1, but, but basically, how did he create it? 
And Genesis chapter 1 answers that question too. In fact, uh, a companion verse is Hebrews 1 and verse 3 that says Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. God sustains this whole universe by the word of his power. And then as you look at Genesis chapter 1, it just said, he said, you know, let there be light. So the big message I want you to understand today as I close is this. The eternal triune God created and is sustaining the universe by the word of his power. The eternal triune God created and is sustaining the universe by the word of his power. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for day two and three today. We're thankful, Father, for godly men and women of the past who looked at the world and saw that the whole world just pointed to you. Lord, some of us, we we struggle with different ideas about this, and that's okay. Lord, I thank you that in the church, we've struggled with it for thousands of years. And yet, Lord, when we look at your revelation, and when we look at the work of your hands, the stars and planets, and this planet that we get to live on, we see your creative power, We see your eternity and we see your sustaining power as you hold it all together. We realize, Lord, in our world today that the devil, his demonic forces and governments and leaders who hate you and and try to live without you, we see the devastation of that. But we pray because we know that your kingdom is eternal and that wherever the word of God is preached and wherever you have Christian believers, men and women and youth and children around this world, your kingdom presence is there by the Holy Spirit of God. And so, Father, we pray for a continual move of your spirit across this world. And we thank you for people that are meeting on this day, Resurrection Sunday, that are worshiping the one true and living God who is all-powerful, who created all things, and who sustains us all by his powerful word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.